Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever you're listening. This is Davis Phil on KDRT LP 95.7 FM in Davis, California. We live at kdrt.org online. I'm Bill Buchanan, and I thank you for listening to our latest remotely recorded program. We'll get back to the studio eventually. My guest today is Gloria Pardina. She will become the next mayor of Davis in July. And with that date approaching, I asked her to visit with us today to talk about coming mayor and about some issues of the day, ones that involve just Davis and ones that involve much more than Davis. Gloria, thank you for appearing on Davisville today. Thank you for having me. So uh, before we start, I'd like to list some of your experiences. It's, it's a full list. Uh, some of this I think you're known for in town and, and some maybe not so much. First, you've been on the city council uh, for two years. You've been mayor pro tem, which means you have stood in for the current mayor, Brett Lee, when he's absent. You also helped start the Davis Phoenix Coalition, which works against intolerance, particularly in LGBTQ areas and promotes a diverse community. You'll be the first Latina mayor in Davis. You're an Aggie, both as a student as an employee. Well, you're retired now, but you were a lab manager in the Department of Neurobiology, Physiology and Behavior. And you have a bachelor's degree in zoology from UC Davis. And you're a parent, and you've lived in Davis since moving here from Los Angeles in 1989. So that's quite a list. <laughs> we'll get to some topics in a minute, but I wanted to start with a broad question. And, and that is, how do all these experiences and interests uh, shape your approach to the decisions that you make for Davis as a member of the council? So I think that the most important way that they shape my approach is that I've had a very wide um, range of experiences and I've interacted with a wide range of communities. So everything from the campus community to, I did a lot of disability advocacy, um, did a lot of advocacy in the school district with children and families. And, um, and of course saw a lot of young people when I was on campus and growing up in a very underrepresented part of Los Angeles and then you know, navigating the community in Davis, it really provided me the opportunity to move between a lot of different worlds and to understand that every community has a different need and that in order to be successful in meeting those needs, you have to really understand the places that you are in. Okay. Um, another general question I wanted to start with is, What's the job of mayor? I mean, what, what are the most important aspects? You, you don't manage things as mayor. We have a city manager for that. You do represent the community. So I, I see it as, um, as just that, as representing the community because we've gone to districts now. I think that the role of mayor has been actually um, uh, become a little more important because, you know, we, will, you know, while we see each council person as representing a district, we're all concerned with the entire community. But I think that uh, the position of mayor will act as the kind of liaison between all of the districts, in, including the district that the mayor is in. And, but yes, I do see it as sort of the, uh, the uh, front face of the city council. And of course, you know, you run the, run the um, meeting. Run the, the city council meetings. Right. And we should explain, you know, the reference about districts, uh, Davis had, until recently, had at-large elections for city council. So everybody in town voted for every seat. But that mm -hmm. is converted now to district elections where candidates will have to come from different parts of town. And, and I think I understand your point to be that mayor is perhaps still uh, a a citywide position in a way, maybe that some of these district seats won't quite be. Yeah, so the, um, I mean, the person who is mayor uh, does have a district, is, is representative of a district, so the mayor is not at large, but because, um, you know, the mayor does chair the meeting, and, and so I, I think that that person has to also you know, try to make sure that all the voices of the different council members are equally represented in the, in the meeting and that, you know, um, 
any any one person's concerns are not lost and that uh, you know we make sure that everyone is satisfied in in being heard that they have been heard okay let's um let's advance now to a, a couple of topics uh there's two that i think are on most people's minds these days one of course is the pandemic that we've been living with for a few months uh the other is is uh, the death of yet another African-American man, uh, George Floyd in Minneapolis, uh, while in police custody in May. Uh, this has led to protests and uh, in, in violence in some cases in cities across the United States. The officer who held him down has been arrested for murder. I should say we're talking on June 3rd, that's a few days before this interview airs, and so events might continue to evolve between when we talk and when this broadcast airs. I know, of course, Davis City Hall and UC Davis have condemned Mr. Floyd's death, as a tragic and horrifying abuse of power. You wrote a blog post about his death for the Phoenix Coalition website in late May. Uh, I do encourage people to look it up, but I'd like to read parts of it here and then, and then ask you to elaborate on, on part of it. Mm -hmm. um, so now I'm, I'm quoting your post and you say, uh, we must sit in the discomfort of the knowing that the darker a person is, the more we are threatened and uncomfortable. The knowing that we are willing to dehumanize our neighbors and our need to be comfortable the knowing that our goodness is complicit in black America's death when we volunteer at food kitchens but refuse to live next door to them, the knowing that just saying we are all in this together does not make it so. Yes, policing is difficult. Yes, poverty and trauma produce people that are at odds with society. Yes, it is complicated, and no, it is not. After these instances, there are many articles on what white America can do to be good allies, all good, and the number one thing we can all do to change our culture is to be honest and to teach that honesty to children. But as I say, there's more to the essay than that, and there's a lot just in that part, though. These words particularly jumped out at me. I think the contradiction sort of catches the times. You, you wrote, yes, it is complicated. No, it is not. And I wondered if you could elaborate on why it's complicated and why it isn't. Um, I think it's complicated because, as I said, um, we we understand we understand a lot about what produces poverty and what produces violence and uh, the understanding in itself is is not is not enough. So you know there there is um, you know we the, we can say that you know we are not prejudiced or we're not racist but the fact is that we all are that everyone has prejudice and everyone has things that they are uncomfortable with and uh to not acknowledge that and to not acknowledge that it it does play a part in in you know what keeps things the same is is very problematic and um you know everything has a duality to it. So policing is is got a duality to it. Uh, the way that we live in relationship with each other has a duality to it. And so, um, you know, all of that is complicated. But you know, if you want to, you know, get to the heart of the matter, you have to be honest. And that I think is the uncomplicated part: is to um, you know, come forward and to say, you know, yes, sometimes everyone makes decisions that are not based on, you know, complete altruism or that are not uh, um, based on our best humanness. So you're saying in a way we all need to be honest with ourselves? We need to be honest with ourselves, absolutely. Uh, for instance, we do a lot of work around bullying, around anti-bullying. And, you know, parents come forward to, we have like a carnival that we do for children and they'll bring their children, you know, to learn about anti-bullying. And um, one of the questions that we ask the parents is, what are you doing to make sure that your children are uh, not bullying others or that they're learning kindness and empathy and things like that and so they'll you know rattle off a lot of um you know things that they're doing that they're teaching their children but what we want to get at is that we are modeling behavior that we don't see 
as um, that our children see and that contributes to bullying in the schools. When we, when parents gossip about other people, when they, you know, make judgments about other children or, you know, we don't want to invite that child because, you know, maybe they've got impulse control problems or, or you know, they're uh, not a nice kid. We're already instilling uh, otherness uh, in, in our children and, and teaching them that, that we're, that we're judging. When we're, when we're talking about each other in, in a community, we're judging and we're teaching that judgment to our children. And I'm not saying that, you know, as adults, we don't process uh, what we, you know, our frustrations with each other as people. I'm just saying that you have to be careful in how you do that in front of children because they don't have the ability to, you know, tease out the nuances of that yet. And, um, uh, or most children don't. Uh, some children are very sophisticated. And so, so that's, that's the point that I'm, that we try to, to that we try to get across to, to parents. Do you think people are afraid to be honest with each other about race? Oh, yes. Yes. I think it's a very difficult conversation to have for most adults and for, and for most people in a community, especially across races. I think it's, it's very difficult to, you know, to have those conversations. I grew up in Houston and, um, and, and there was a lot of racism even amongst the Hispanic community uh, against people who were African American. And then, you know, between the uh, whites and the, and the um, Latinos in, in Houston. And so it, it just, it happens across mm -hmm. all cultures. It's a human failing. It is a human failing. And even when I was growing up in uh, Los Angeles, at one point, there was a large influx of people from El Salvador. And there was a lot of tension between the people from El Salvador and the people from Mexico. So it definitely is, as I said, something that we struggle with and that we have to identify. One of the reasons you helped start uh the Phoenix Coalition in Davis is because uh, one of your sons was beaten here in Davis because of his sexual orientation. Uh, this is your son, Mikey, everybody yes. calls him. This was in 2013. The man who assaulted him was sentenced to five years in, in prison. Um, you acted, I guess, is part of what I'm making a point here. I, and I'm listening to you talk about honesty and, and from your own actions, you then acted on something you saw to try to prevent it. I wanted to ask, how's Mikey doing today? He's doing very well. He's uh, living in Sacramento, kind of in the heart of the protest right now. So it's a little, uh, it's a little anxiety in, uh, inducing, but he has um, you know, recovered, I think, very well. I know that it's still difficult. Some things are still difficult for him. You know, from where we started, I feel pretty lucky. All right. Uh, we are talking with Gloria Pardita, who is currently mayor pro tem of Davis. She will become mayor of Davis uh, in July. I'm Bill Buchanan, and this is Davisville on KDRT. I wanted to ask you also about the pandemic. Uh, that's another big issue these days. Uh, you know, it won't be over when you become mayor. Uh, Davis has seemed fairly fortunate in terms of health, uh, you know, as we speak today. I don't believe there's been deaths in town, but the financial fallout is intense with unemployment is above 10%. Many people are distressed. It has certainly whacked the city's budget. I don't need to tell you that. I know no one has a crystal ball, but based on everything, all the different roles you play in Davis and now on the council and the incoming mayor, what do you think is ahead? for this summer for Davis with regards to the pandemic? So I am um, definitely a lot of challenges. There are, um, you know, a lot of concerns still. I think, you know, we talked uh, about the budget last night for a very long time. And um, I think that we are in a surprisingly good shape. We came into it at, at a, in a good uh, place financially. 
and made some really good decisions that have uh, positioned us in the place to come through, uh, not without, you know, challenge, but definitely not in complete uh, dire straits. So from that uh, respect, I am uh, pleased. Of course, you know, there is no crystal ball and we don't know how long it's going to last and, uh, you know, how many businesses are going to recover and how many businesses are not going to be able to open up again. All of that will make a, a big difference. And we don't yet have a handle on the actual virus. We don't know if if we're going to get a vaccine, if that, that how effective that vaccine is going to be and when it'll come. So there's a lot of unknowns, but I do think that the leadership we have right now in the city is, is very good and, and that we are very proactive and um, very prudent in the decisions that are made. And so from that respect, I think um, that, that things are going to be, um, as I said, not easy, but they will be you know, manageable. Uh, Is there any change or, or one or two in particular that the city's doing that, that people ought to know about at this stage? As far as? Uh, well, I mean, maybe the, the effect on, on City Hall, on the budgets. I, I know you were discussing it last night, and I haven't followed the meeting. I don't know what decisions you Yeah, made. so we've made a lot of decisions to not fill positions that are vacant or you know, people, we have some people that are retiring and we're not going to fill those positions. Uh, we have a lot of uh, CIP projects that will uh, be defunded, which means that um, if we were getting ready to fix uh, a bike path or, um, you know, those types of big projects, that they're going to be put on hold, they're going to be deferred uh, for now to uh, have that money come back into the general fund. Okay, and CIT, these are capital projects? CI, CIP, these CIP. are capital improvement projects. Got it, okay. So like you were yeah. saying, a, a road repair or something like that, yeah. Right, something like that. And uh, so we, we asked every department to come up with a list of places that money could be cut uh, if we were thinking of doing like a big infrastructure project that has been deferred. So we've deferred a lot of things that we can um, as much as we can, and also we are going back to the uh, labor units and asking uh, for furloughs uh, or for uh, deferment on their cost of living increases and things like that. Uh, there was uh, some, some, we had some commenters talk about how the state is asking for people to take a 10% cut, but you can't do that without negotiating with the with the labor units, and so we are going to ask people if you know to please consider taking either furloughs or a cost of living increase deferment, so that we don't have to lay people off. I would prefer that we don't lay people off, and the and I think that as much as we can do to keep people from becoming unemployed. I think that that's a really important thing, uh, not just for our city and for our area, but in general. I mean, th this is worldwide, this problem is worldwide, and, and the economy is, is going to really have a hard time recovering. Yeah. And I, I think that it's important to do our part in, in making sure that we, you know, are helping people get through this. And so I hope that the bargaining units you know, okay. see that as well. I guess people can, of course, they can follow this in the Davis Enterprise or the Davis Vanguard. Yes. Or there's some variety mm -hmm. of ways people can follow the story. Uh, we have, oh, I think about eight or nine minutes left. Um, oh, one last thing, I guess. So recreational programs like the pools, things like that. I mean, that's no decision on that yet. It depends on the pandemic, I suppose, right? It depends on the uh, order from the state. So, so the know, state public health office order. Yes. So the, there are different phases and we take uh, direction from, from the state. Okay. There's a couple of Davis issues I wanted to talk about uh, or, or get your thoughts on. Just, you know, life goes on. Yes. Um, uh, growth is one of those recurring issues in Davis. There's, there's two projects, 
fairly major ones that are before the city in one form or another. One is the Davis Innovation Sustainability Campus. That's the new name for the research and housing project that's proposed in, I'd call it Northeast Davis along the Mace Curve. Mm -hmm. uh, it's up to two and a half million square feet of business uses, 850 residential units of varied sizes and affordability. And just quickly, what do you think of this project overall? Is this something you like, don't like? So I think that overall, it is something that is needed in, in Davis. It will, um, of course, you know, give us a, a place to have innovation uh, grow in Davis. And it's a great stream of revenue, which we are going to sorely need. Uh, it also has the housing com component, which it um, mitigates a little bit you know, people who are going to be driving in to work at, at this uh, location. But, you know, mostly I think that it provides a great opportunity for some of that transfer of uh, innovation that's happening at the campus to, um, you know, to stay in Davis. We have, uh, you know, a lot of, we have a lot of uh, young people who are coming out of the university and have got great ideas and uh, it would be nice to be able to keep uh, that in town. So the, uh, this will go on the ballot eventually because of Davis rules, right? It'd be an annexation mm -hmm. of the city, so it takes a, a vote. The project as it's proposed right now, are you happy with it? Anything you'd wanna change before it might go on the ballot someday? Um, I'm concerned about the traffic and the transportation and the impacts that obviously would would happen with this. And so I'm, you know, we are we are having some conversations around that. The other project that I wanted to ask about is uh, the University Mall redevelopment. Uh, this mm -hmm. would mean tearing down the existing mall there at Russell and Anderson, except for Trader Joe's, which is over there by Sycamore. Mm -hmm. and replacing that current building with mixed use development uh, up to 264 apartments and I guess about 135,000 square feet of stores and offices. There'd be seven story buildings. This is right across the street from the campus from some of the, the dorms there. Uh, mm -hmm. Just recently the City Planning Commission voted seven to zero to advise against it. Uh, I understand yes. the developers still plan to bring it to the city. What are your mm -hmm. thoughts on, on the proposal as it is? So first of all, I keep hearing seven stories, but in fact, it's five. Um, okay. To, and I don't know where that seven story uh, information is coming from, and I hear it quite often, but it is, it is five stories. Uh, maybe the height is very close to what a seven story building would be. I, I'm not really sure what the confusion is. But yeah, I'd have to go back and check. I was looking at city documents. I don't want to say that I read it there, though, because I'm not confident okay. where okay. it was. <laughs> Uh, All right. But, you know, things like this also can change, uh, you uh -huh. know, in the course of a proposal. Right. So, so I, I think that that development, it, it surprised me that it was so unanimously uh, disliked by the Planning Commission. And I'm not sure if it is kind of an old, mem uh, um, you know, uh, displeasure with the university not providing housing and the feeling that the university should be providing this housing because it is geared towards students because it's right across the street from the university. And, um, but I do think that this is what we're asking for. We're asking for infill. So on the one hand, you have the innovation center, which is, uh, you know, pushing the boundary. And so people say, no, we don't want that. We want infill. And then you do infill and people say, no, that's too big. We don't want that type of infill. Well, that, that's human nature, isn't it? You know, it's, yes. we, we want the best of everything. Right. And so I think, but I do think that we have a um, obligation to build housing. I mean, not just from a human standpoint, not just from a social standpoint that we need to house people and we need to alle alleviate the, uh, you know, the, the pressure on housing. But there are, uh, you know, certain numbers of housing that we have to build that we're obligated to build as a and And so this is a great opportunity to, you know, get to some of those numbers that, that we need to hit. And people talk about like the four bedrooms and we don't need four bedrooms. You know, that's just geared towards students. 
Well, there are students who are living in two bedroom apartments elsewhere in town. You could empty two two bedroom apartments of students that would be closer to campus and have those two bedroom apartments now opened up for families or workers. Uh, so it makes really good sense, I think, uh, to have this in, in this location. And I know that, again, people are worried about traffic, but I keep saying that the traffic is there already. There are already that many students who are going, you know, that are living in, uh, you know, 12 to a, a house and that are traveling down the same roads. So they're already there is your point. Well, so I, I can imagine these might be some questions that I could hear you asking when it does come before the council or some of these points perhaps. Sure. Couple minutes left. I'm wondering, what have you learned about Davis from your first two years on the council? Any surprises? Um, there are a lot of surprises actually. <laughs> um, well, we may not have time to get to all of them then. but no, you, no, we definitely will not. But I think that what the number one thing that I've learned is that you have to be very patient, that things move very, very slowly, uh, that uh, process is very important to our community, and that, it, as I said earlier, uh, the thing that I've learned in working in different communities is that you have to make sure that you bring everyone along, that you get to, you get to where people are, you go to where people are, and, um, not everyone is going to ever be happy that and as a matter of fact if you if you have uh, something where everyone is a little bit unhappy, then that's probably the best place to be. Anything as a mayor that you particularly want to stand for? Well, I definitely want to stand for listening to people and being equitable in all of the decisions that I that I make. I mean, before the you know COVID uh, situation, definitely had some ideas that that I wanted to you know push forward. But it feel it seems that now all we're going to be working on is uh, recovery and um, you know keeping just keeping the lights on. Do you think you're going to want more of this in two years, another term? It's hard to say right at this moment. It's, uh, there are some days where I'm, I feel like there's no way. But I have to say that most of the time, I am enjoying this a lot more than I thought that I would be. Well, Gloria, thank you very much for taking time to talk with us today. Well, thank you. Thank We've you been for... talking with Gloria Pardita, who is a member of the council, currently Mayor Pro Tem. She will become Mayor of Davis in uh, less than a month. I'm Bill Buchanan. This is Davisville on KDRT. Thank you for listening.